Well, I trust that we're all ready to listen with our heart this morning for the Lord to speak to us again in our responsibilities to him. Jesus said in John 4, 23 and 24, that it ethically is the good and right thing to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Where John records in John 4 and verse 23, Jesus' words, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. John 4, 24, God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus talks about the true worshipers. Do you realize there are true worshipers and false worshipers? True worshipers keep all of their attention upon the Father as they worship him because they worship in spirit and in truth and not just in outward form. And so our topic this morning is the subject of worship and praise. praise. Our responsibilities to God. We said in the first place, our greatest responsibility is to love him. Then we can demonstrate that by trusting him. Last week. This week, we can express that by our worship of him. So our worship of the Father expresses our love and gratitude and appreciation to him. Now, since most of Christian ethics deals with the relations of people, then in our look here at the ethical responsibility of worship, I'm going to concentrate on public praise rather than private praise, because public praise has a certain role to fulfill according to the scriptures and we're going to look at some of what the scripture teaches about that but in passing we'll mention private praise just to be complete in our discussion of praise private praise can basically be done in one of three ways it can be done in meditation upon god and his word and his greatness in our heart or in our mind this is psalm 48 verses 9 and 10. meditation that is simply going over in your mind or in your heart the thoughts of God's greatness, of your love for him, your appreciation for him and for his work. Psalm 48, verse 9. We have thought of thy loving kindness, O God, in the midst of thy temple. Now, you might not realize it, but that right there in itself is just a form of worship. Worship is not saying, I worship you, Lord. That's using the term. But you can do that and not be worshiping God in spirit and in truth. So worship has to be something more than just literal words that are stated. That's why we start with John 4, 23. The Father seeketh such to worship him in spirit and in truth. He seeketh, he seeks after the true worshipers, not the false ones, whose minds are always carried from this thing to that thing. Basically, your mind is going to have to be stayed on him to be worshiping in spirit and in truth. Or it's easy just to go the ritual way like a lot of people do. You have choruses and songs and hymns and tunes and rhythms memorized. And you can give lip service and not heart service unto the Lord. He said of the Pharisees of his day, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you that you serve me with your lips, with your mouth, but not with your heart. So that's something we should avoid. Utterly avoid. Worship with our lips and not with our lips attached to our heart i mean if it's going to be just worship from the lips it might as well not be worship because it's not in spirit and in truth and he doesn't receive that he's not seeking after worshipers who only worship in words and with their mouth but here's a form of private praise just thinking on god's loving kindness now he doesn't say this is a form of worship but there's just so much to and about worship in the old testament that maybe it's not obvious on the surface where a person raised in the charismatic movement today would think you have to sing a tune to worship God well we're going to get to public praise here in a moment but private praise just begins with mulling over God and his work and his greatness just in your heart in your mind I mean do you ever just sit down and you're thinking you know abstractly you're not thinking Lord how great is your world or how great is your work you just look around you and start thinking of that 
Well, you don't have to address that to him. You said, we were thinking, Lord, of your loving kindness in the temple. We were just thinking about your loving kindness. That was the thought of our heart that constitutes one form of private praise. According to thy name, O God, so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. So he mentions praise in verse 10. That proves that we're talking about a form of private worship or private praise. Meditation. Meditation on the word. Now, we'll come to meditation and study that as such later on in ethics, but meditation basically is a form of worship. Now, it has other side benefits of encouraging you and building up your heart and keeping the word of God fresh in your mind. It has a lot of subjective benefits to you if you are the participator in meditation as a form of private praise. But God gets praise as you and your mind, without thinking about him, without connecting everything to him in literal thoughts in your mind, he gets praise when we think of his loving kindness, when we think of all the times we've been blessed or prospered or healed or delivered in the past. Just remembering a time that you got healed is a form of praise. praise. Then in the second place, Private praise can be vocal praise, but that is done in private. That is, without the presence of others around you. Psalm chapter 5, without the presence of others around you. Psalm 5, beginning with verse 1. Give ear to my words, O Lord, and consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee I will pray. You see, there's many times just a connection, right, between meditation and and then vocal praise, vocal, whether it's in the presence of others or in your own presence and no one else's, it's connected with meditation. Well, that only makes sense. You think before you speak or you're supposed to. Verse 3, my voice shalt thou hear in the morning. So we've gone beyond the meditation of Psalm 48, 9 and Psalm 5, 1 to vocal expression. But it's early in the morning, so probably... He's all by himself here. He has reference to when he wakes up in the morning. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and I will look up. Sometimes the psalms are called prayers. Sometimes they're called praises. Because really, although one term extends beyond the other, they're one and the same. Psalm chapter 3 could well have been vocal praise done in private. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. He's out fleeing from his son Absalom, and it's nighttime. You see, Psalm 5 is the morning, and Psalm 4 is probably evening. But anyway, we get down to verse 5. Now he's really... This is all nighttime because, you know, he's concerned about laying his head down. But now you can tell it's morning time because he's looking back. I laid me down and slept. I awake. It's all over with. So now we're to morning. I awake for the Lord sustained me. All those thoughts last night before I went to sleep about what's going to happen. He says, now I know from experience. Verse 6, I'll not be afraid anymore of ten thousands of people. Those that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. Thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord, and thy blessing is upon thy people. Probably private praise, but that that's done vocally. Psalm 119 and verse 62. It's his praise, and I think, again, the context shows he's probably by himself. Because he says, At midnight I will rise and give thanks unto thee, because of thy righteous judgments. Well, he's probably the only one up around that time, except maybe the sentries guarding the palace or something. So he's by himself, but he rises up. But it's not meditation because it's vocal praise. At midnight, I will rise to give thanks unto thee because of thy righteous judgments. And then for, we've got something special for those of us in the Christian era. In the third place, we can praise in the spirit or praise in tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, 22, those that speak in, in the Spirit are speaking mysteries in the Spirit to the Father, to the Father. That's one form of speaking in tongues, tongues as praise to God. 
So that's really not our topic. That's just for completeness sake, private praise. Now we come to public praise. Public praise is that which is done before many witnesses. Now this is where we get into the ethics of praise because it's an ethical testimony to God's existence, to God's greatness, and to our dependence upon him, to all of those people around us. But it has to be done among many witnesses for it to be public praise. And it's our ethical testimony to God's existence, to his greatness, and to our dependence upon him. Now, with all of that introduction, we ask the question, why do we consider worship to be an ethical responsibility of ours to God? Why do we consider worship to be an ethical responsibility? Well, we're going to be using quite a few passages this morning, but it's not just hopscotching through the Bible to pull some out. I think you'll see there are certain trains of thought that we're following along, certain things that the Bible has taught, certain things that you no doubt have seen in isolated passages before. You've seen a teaching on praise, particularly in the book of Psalms, where we'll obviously spend most of our time without seeing that somehow there's a connection between all of these passages as they fit under certain trains of thought and that it all proves that it is an ethical responsibility, not just, you know, a charismatic one, not just something that we have the option of doing or of not doing, but that it's part of Christian ethics. It's part of our ethical responsibility to worship God. So let me suggest three reasons why we say it's our ethical responsibility to worship God. In the first place, the Old Testament teaches it's our ethical responsibility. We owe that to God. That's why we call it responsibility. We owe it to him. In the first place, simply because we are alive. Because you see, in numerous passages in the Old Testament, the rhetorical question is asked, can the grave give you any praise? Or can death give you any praise? Well, we know death or grave, he doesn't mean that. But the people involved in that, talking about those people giving praise to God in this life, can those who have died, can those who are in the grave, can those who have gone to Sheol, can those give God any praise? There's, there's a play here about whether you're alive or whether you're dead. And the scriptures will teach that as long as you are alive, as long as you are alive, then you have the ethical responsibility to worship. Such passages as Psalm 6-5 asks this rhetorical question, can the grave or death offer praise to God? Psalm 30 and verse 9, there's no remembrance of God in death. Now, he's not teaching on resurrection and life after death and future life and all of that. He's getting across another point. You can't use those out of context and say that the Jews didn't have any concept of life after life or of life after death. When he says there's no remembrance, well, don't those righteous ones who have died still remember God? Well, of course they do. They're right in his immediate presence. But he's teaching something about praise and God's deliverance of us now in this life. Psalm 88, verses 10 and 11. Psalm 115, which we'll look at, verses 17 and 18. Psalm 115, 17 to 18. All of these are saying essentially the same thing. A whole host of passages asking this rhetorical question or stating this in so many words. Psalm 115, the last two verses. The dead praise not the Lord. Neither any that go down into silence. Well, I trust you see what he's saying. He's not talking about concepts of future life. Because no doubt those who are righteous and who have died are praising God. But he's talking, well, he goes on in verse 18. We will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. So it's a contrast between those who have died and those who are still alive. And then over in Isaiah 38, verses 18 to 20, during the time of Hezekiah, with the sickness problem that he has, Isaiah 38, 18 to 20, he says, For the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee, they that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth, but the living 
the living. He emphasizes it. The living shall praise thee. As I do this day, the Father to the children shall make known thy truth. So you connect this then with another train of thought that we see in the book of Psalms where the writer says that we are among those in the land of the living. There seems to be direct contrasts here. The land of the dead, they can offer no praise to God in the way and in the sense that we can and that we are required to. Because Psalm 27, 13 those of us who are alive, are alive in this particular place he refers to in verse 13 as the land of the living. The land of the living. Now, I know most churches, it looks like you'd be in a tomb when you go inside because no one's praising God. Amen. But if you're a part of the land of the living, then it's our responsibility to praise him. Of course, we could say you're probably dead without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what gives you your life. But people who have the baptism sometimes are dead while they live and are not praising God as is our responsibility. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He believes he's going to get some good things in the next life, but he said, I need good things in this life as well. And unless I had kept on believing that I was going to see God's goodness in the land of the living, I probably would have perished and gone on to be with him so he's learned a lesson that's verse 14 to wait on the lord Amen. Amen. wait on the lord be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart well that's really not a good translation he says be of good courage and be strong not god will strengthen you you be strong and wait i say on the lord but he's learned a lesson wait on the lord while you're in the land of the living and then over in psalm 116 Verses 8 and 9. Thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Mm -hmm. So death and life are contrasted. And worship is always brought into play when we're talking about this contrast of death and life such as over in Psalm 118 and verse 17. A contrast between death and life and the responsibility therefore placed upon those who are in the land of the living to utter praise to God. Psalm 118, 17, I shall not die but live. Well, notice the contrast, death and life. The rhetorical question, can death give you praise? The answer is no, only those who are in the land of the living. So here, I guess, we could say it's all summed up in one verse, this theology of public praise for the living in the Old Testament. I shall not die, but live, and here's what I'll do when and while I live, and declare the works of the Lord, which is a form of praise of him as well, and declare the works of the Lord. Then, over in Psalm 104 and verse 33, under another group of statements we're said to be required to praise while we have any being which is the same as saying while you're in the land of the living psalm 104 and verse 33 now you're familiar with all of these scattered passages but maybe not drawn together as a theology of worship in the old testament i will sing unto the lord as long as i live I will sing praise to my God while I have any being. Why is it we're finding these same words, the same concept over and over? Because there's a point being emphasized here, that it's an utter ethical duty of ours, Amen. that as long as we have any being in us, as long as we live, to be worshiping and praising God all the time. Private praise, public praise as well. We're just using the latter because that's our concern now. Psalm 146. In verse 2, while I live, will I praise the Lord, I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Psalm 146.2 is the same as Psalm 104.33. Acts 17.28, 
For Paul says in him we live and move and have our being. And it's all summed up in the last verse of the Psalter, Psalm 150 and verse 6. Why is it our responsibility? Simply because we are alive. Long ago, someone sang the words that the hills are alive with the sound of music. But it's a totally different concept for those of us who are believers and followers of Jesus. But it should be just that, that the hills are alive with the sound of music. But it's our voice that's giving music to God. Let everything that has any being that's among the land of the living, now it's under a different figure, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, praise ye the Lord. So do you understand all of those connections? Many verses teaching the same thing, that as long as we are alive, and don't get into rhetorical questions and then end up with no doctrine of the future life or life after life or life after death or the resurrection or your abode after death with the Lord. Just stay with what the psalmist says. Can those in the grave praise you? No, not as they can when you're living with those in the land of the living. It's, it's something different entirely. And of course, maybe, just maybe, those who don't praise God in the land of the living don't even make it over to the land of God's side on the other side of the grave. There's a high probability that will exist because it's an utter commandment of God to us. And it's a total responsibility of ours to him to give him worship publicly because we are alive, because we have being all the time over the New Testament. It's, it's in everything. Give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's expressed in different forms, but the truth is still there. Paul writing to those at Thessalonica it's the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you that in everything you give thanks. Amen. Then let's move to a second answer to the question why we can say that worship is an ethical responsibility. Secondly, because of who he is. It's an ethical responsibility of ours because of who he is. Psalm 118, 28 to 29. You have to listen with more than just your mind. You have to hear with your heart as well. Psalm 118, 28 and 29. Because who he is, the psalmist said here, it's because you're my God. Because of who you are, I'm going to praise you. Thou art my God. And I will praise thee. And here's his parallelism. Thou art my God. It's because of who you are, Lord, that I praise. I will exalt thee. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Chiefly, verse 28. Psalm 18 and verse 3. Who is he? David said, well, starting in verse 2, you're my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, my buckler, the horn of my salvation, my high tower, and I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. I'll call upon him because he's worthy to be praised. And why is he worthy? Because of this list of descriptions of him in verse 2, that he's a total source of comfort and deliverance and protection for his child. Rock and fortress and deliver God, strength, buckler, horn of my salvation, and my high tower because of who he is. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power because of who you are, your creator. Thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Revelation 4.11. Then Revelation chapter 5, verses 12 through 13. The heavenly creatures sang with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them 
heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Why? It's because of who he is. The Lamb of God. Not so much emphasized yet what he's doing, but because of who he is. He's the Lamb of God. Psalm 48, verse 1. He's to be greatly praised because of who he is. He's the great God. Great is the Lord, and therefore he's to be greatly praised. Psalm 48, 1, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And then in Psalm 145, Psalm 145, verses 1, and following, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Same as in Psalm 148.1. And his greatness is unsearchable. And then you can just go through a list of all of the characteristics of God describing who he is, such as he's the living God. Then if you're in the land of the living, I think the two go together. He's the almighty God. He's the healing God. This is who he is. And all of the other titles that you could give to refer to him. And then thirdly, because of what he has done. We're analyzing what you probably experience in your worship without you thinking about it. You experience this. Why, why do you praise God? Well, because you're alive, because he's God, he's your Lord and Savior, and because of what he's done for you is chiefly the very reasons why you praise him. Yeah. We analyze something that you don't analyze whenever you do it, you just do it. We're showing you more of the mechanics of it and what's involved. Exodus chapter 15, he's praised because of what he's done. The theology of worship in the Old Testament. Exodus 15 and verse 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, and here's the reason why, because he hath triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So it's the Exodus, the Exodus account, that then is found over in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, and just throughout several dozen times in the Old Testament. God's telling the Jews that I have a claim upon you because I delivered your forefathers in the grave, Exodus and with the multitude of plagues upon the Egyptians, then I have a claim upon your life and you owe me something as a result of that. Amen. And what we're studying now is that they owed their worship and their praise. Psalm 98 and verse 1. O oh, sing unto the Lord. A new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. But why is it praised? Because of what he's done. Marvelous things. The Lord has made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. And all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. So in particular deliverances that the psalmist has in mind, God has manifested who he is and what he did, and he's to be praised as a result. And what about the familiar passage in Psalm 103, verses 1 to 5? Amen. Praise offered because of what God either does for you or has done, or if you're really involved in faith and it's what you are expecting him to do, and you offer praise ahead of time. Psalm 103, verses 1 to 5.
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, things which he has done for us, who forgives and he enumerates them, all our iniquities, who heals all of our diseases, not some iniquities and some diseases, but all iniquities and all diseases, who redeems thy life from destruction, who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, and who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Now he goes on in the chapter to talk about our sins being forgiven, but that's already been dealt with there in verse 3, which is another reason to praise him because of what he has done. Well, now that basically sums up why we have the ethical responsibility to worship God. So it's something to bear in mind as long as you live, as Psalm 150 and verse 6 teaches down to your last breath, it ought to be praise God instead of make sure Johnny gets his share of the inheritance, which is generally the last breath of a lot of people is arguing over who's going to get what's left. Well, that'd be a terrible thing to be talking about right before you have to meet your maker. Yeah. It's arguing over who's going to get all your goods that you've stored up. <laughs> it'd be time to set a match to all of it because it won't do you any good. Yeah. Oh, you can leave it to someone, some relative, it'll do them some good. But what a thing to be talking about. Or a lot of people just screaming their heads off, oh God, I'm scared, I don't want to die. That's a terrible thing to be saying, a terrible confession to make. Your last breath that you have. Or thank Dr. Smith for all of the good things he's done for me while I've been alive. But he can't keep me alive, though, so don't thank him for that. But thank him for everything else that he's done for me, like pollute my body with drugs so I'm dying early instead of later. People pick many different things as their last comment before they die. And while you have any breath, you see, there's your last one. Psalm 115, verse 6, it's to be praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Here I come or whatever it is that you have to say before you go under. Now, if you read some testimonies of some of the men of God who have died in the past, you'll find comments like that. You know, Lord, receive me home will be the last thing that they say instead of arguing over the basset hound, make sure he's fed when you're gone or something. People will think up 101 things to fight and fuss and argue about or comment about or just to tell everyone around that you love them so much and you're going to miss them and all of that. Well, yeah. <laughs> if they're truly saved, then death is not a period in your relationship. It's just a comma. Yeah. The sentence will be completed later on, as it were. As long as they're believers, death is not a period. It's just a comma in your relationship with them. But you're being ushered into the immediate presence of God. That moment, the angels come and carry your spirit away. You don't want to be screaming help or arguing or something. <laughs> you want to be praising God Amen. with your last breath that you have. Hallelujah. Well, you see, the scriptures teach you can't wait until then. Sometimes, you know, you go too quickly. And, and you know, you never know when you're going to go. That's why the old Catholic priest will come and give you extreme unction just in case you're going to die. <laughs> you never know. You wait until you get down to death's door, but boy, you're in trouble if you get there too fast and go over it too quickly before you've got extreme unction on you. You don't need extreme unction. You need to praise God with your last breath. But what about all the day long? You've got breath all the day long. That's why you're alive, as long as you're in the land of the living. Because the scriptures teach there will be no praise of God in death. Maybe those who don't praise him here, for them, there will be no praise of God in death. Nothing but cursing and swearing in the pit for those people. Because those that praise God in the next life have to have that habit formed here in this life. Everybody tries to make too much of an unwarranted distinction between this life and the next life. That you can do anything and be anything here. And once you die and go up through the hole in the sky then just automatically you're transformed into a Christian once you die. And people will live like a sinner here and think they can be a Christian in the next world then. It doesn't work that way. You have to form these godly Christian habits while you're in the land of the living. Yeah. Yeah. And one habit to form is to always be a praiser of God. Hallelujah. If you'll turn back to Psalm 22 and verse 3, 
It applies to Israel, but the principle is the same for Christians today. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Or as the other versions give it, O thou that are, art enthroned upon the praises of Israel, which is really what the word means. It's drawn from the imagery of the tabernacle and the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. Probably a figure of speech that has reference to that, but at the same time has reference to Israel's habit of praise. Now, according to Second Chronicles chapter 20, God was with Israel, enthroned in her midst whenever she was effective in her praise to God and obedient as well. Second Chronicles chapter 20, the case of Jehoshaphat yeah. and the armies of Israel being praisers and not mm -hmm. warriors. And as a result, this verse in principle form is fulfilled. Lord, you inhabit the praises of your people. You're enthroned upon that. In other words, you're in their midst whenever your people are praising you. Now, there's just something peculiar about that. You can't praise every single moment. You can't get anything else done. You can't get anything else said if it's praise, you know, praise God, thank you, Jesus, every single moment of your life. That's not what we're saying. But when you're in the land of the living, you have opportunities all the time to worship the Lord and to praise him. I mean, I guess I've met people who are so spiritual, they think they have to give you a Bible verse every time they talk to you and say, well, this is proof in such and such passage why I bought a green car instead of a yellow one. <laughs> or I'm going to thank Jesus every time. Well, you know, that can just be an outward form right there. You're trying to prove something in what you're doing so that other people are convinced you're spiritual. But that doesn't prove anything to God, the one who looks in the heart. That's why we started with meditation, because your praise begins in your heart. You're grateful in your heart. And I don't know how many times I just push my chair away from my desk without saying anything and just start thinking generally thinking about the topic of what God has done. Sometimes who he is, but I guess more times than that, what he's done. In other words, all my past experiences and past occasions of blessing and past occasions where he has led and directed and delivered and prospered and healed. Amen. And that's just a form of praising God. Praise you can be so blessed and edified and encouraged whenever you take the time out to worship that way, and then before too long as a charismatic, of course, you've got your hands up in the air, you're dancing around in the room or something yeah. like that, which, according to David's life, is certainly allowed and certainly effective. Now, it'll confuse other people around you sometimes, but it'll bring glory to God. So another question we might ask is, why should this worship be public worship? I want to give you, uh, again, several reasons why. Our worship should go beyond just private praise. You see, basically, the argument of the people in the church is that I can worship God in my heart. And that's valid. But it's also valid that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So you start with private praise, but it always is going to end up public whenever you get in the midst of many witnesses. Well, in the first place, it's a testimony to all of those pagans around us. It just confounds them that we praise someone whom we cannot see. They can't understand how we can be so caught up, so raptured in someone whom our eyes cannot behold. So it confounds them, the heathen around us. It confuses them because many times right in the middle of adversity is when we're praising God the most. And for a heathen, he just wrecked your car, and you're saying, praise the Lord. He's confused over that. He wonders what funny farm you escaped from. What are you praising? What's there to be happy about now? Well, there's everything to be happy about now. Number one, you're still alive after that automobile accident. So we're back to land of the living there, which is one of the underlying causes and reasons there. While you're alive, you have to praise God while you have breath and being. But it just confuses them. If you praise around some heathen, pagan church member or otherwise, right in the midst of all your adversity, that's what is confusing to them. And in the final place, it convicts them of their own unthankfulness.
So our praise is a testimony to the heathen in that it confounds, confuses, and convicts them. Because here their car has not been damaged and they're cursing and swearing that they're going to be late. And your car suffered a thousand dollars worth of damage. Plus you're going to be late. Plus you're praising God in the midst of all of it. So he thinks I've got more to be grateful for. My car is not even damaged. I'm not injured at all. All that's going to happen to me, negatively speaking, is I'm going to be late for my appointment. But here this lunatic has a car that's been destroyed. They've got more to lose, but they're praising more. I'm not praising at all. Convicts those old pagan, heathen church members out there of their own ungratefulness. And that's why they'll devise, the pagan church member will devise little biblical proof text schemes to prove why you're wrong and he's right. Really, when, it, when you reduce everything to its final essence, he's convicted that he knows that he doesn't praise God like you do. Now, he can rationalize that in arguments, but in his own mind, in his own mind, in his own heart, that religious person has to wonder how in the world you can be so happy and so grateful for the little amount or the little blessing or, that you have or something that's gone wrong with you. So Psalm 109 in verse 30. We have confounded and confused people in our day with our praise in this church Amen. and convict some people Amen. to the point they just go ahead and leave. Amen. It bothers them so much that we don't seem to be afraid or embarrassed or anything just to give God all the glory Amen. and to do it with a full expressive voice. Praise God. Amen. They shout when it comes time for football, and we shout when it comes time for church. And so that bothers them. Psalm 108 in verse 3, I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. Which is simply what the first verse is saying. We just read one of them. I will sing praises unto thee among the nations. Now, nations means outside of Israel. See, we're talking about those outside of our confines, Christianity and this body and so forth and we've gotten in trouble with city authorities for one thing for our worship for our noise that's what they call it we don't call it noise we call it worship and praise oh it's okay if it's a noise and the bible says make a loud noise under the lord as long as it's a joyful noise at the same time not racket racket is when people make noise and it's not from their heart but a joyful noise of thanksgiving and praise and worship Chapter 57, verses 9 through 11. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people, and I will sing unto thee among the nations. Now, you're getting the import of this. Amen. This means we're talking about it as an ethical responsibility, and remember, basically, in all of ethics, we... We are talking about our relations with others, especially other people. And if this is one worship, one reason why we should offer public praise to God, it's a testimony to the heathen round about us, then we're outside of our worship time right here in the church. We're out wherever you're out when you're around the heathen. For the continuation of this message, please turn the tape over. <laughs>